Okay, so this is a very crucial week. The last week here uh, and in other uh, aspects we have the uh, dual degree project presentations, the master's thesis project presentations, everything going on in this week. Uh, so we'll continue with what we were discussing. Uh, well, uh, I, I did not actually have a class on Wednesday, but in lieu of that, I recorded something. So again, sorry about that, uh, that weird arrangement. Uh, I hope you must have seen a little bit of that lecture. Okay, because whatever we are going to discuss right away now, uh, we'll be building on that. So we discussed something called the principle of virtual work uh, in that recorded lecture. And uh, today I'm going to discuss a couple of applications and then uh, move on to the last topic of this chapter. So applications of the principle of virtual work. Uh, let me go to the next page. And the uh, uh, application that I'm going to take up is, uh, well, the problem is familiar to us, but the method will be new. So what I intend to show you is this very familiar uh, cantilever beam. which is subjected to this distributed loading. In fact, this uniformly distributed loading. Okay. Uh, now the question is that, what is the deflection? What is the deflection at this end? This is our question. So I want to use the principle of virtual work. Earlier, when I had recorded that previous lecture, I had mentioned that uh, basically we would be using these steps, okay, the virtual work associated with virtual forces as a method for finding the deflection. So these four steps that I had enlisted here, this is the thing that I'm going to use. In particular, I'm going to use this formula. Okay, this is the recipe which is going to allow me to uh, obtain the deflection. So just as a very, very brief recap, this delta P is the virtual force which I'm going to apply at the location where the deflection is desired. Furthermore, this virtual force will be applied in a direction in which the deflection is desired. This delta is actually the desired deflection. Desired deflection meaning at the location where it is desired as well as in the direction in which it is desired. So it is something very, very specific. On the right hand side, I have this sigma denoting that whatever calculation I do here, it has to be over the entire body or over the entire structure. This delta F is the internal virtual force which is generated at different parts of the body in response to this delta P. So as a quick example here, we have this truss to begin with, this green color delta P equal to 1 is not there, but this blue colored external loading is there. So for this calculation of this delta F, what I'm going to do is, First, I'm going to remove this blue colored external force and just apply this delta P at the point where I'm desiring the deflection. In response to this delta P, within these various members of the truss, some forces will be generated. Those forces are referred to as the internal forces. And it is those internal forces in the various members of this truss which will be referred to this by this delta F. Similarly, instead of a truss, if you have a beam, then add various sections, at various cut sections of the beam. Uh, let me just see. So it's like this. So if you have a beam, it is exactly the problem that uh, I'm going to discuss now actually. So you have this external loading. I desire the uh, deflection at this end. So I apply this virtual force at that end after removing the external load and then at various cut sections within the beam, I determine the 
the corresponding load which is generated as a result of the application of this force okay so and finally this u uh, represents the the deflection or the uh, the deformation in general because uh, this this kind of things uh, here it is written as delta f into u but it can also be written as delta m into theta because the units are the same okay so uh, in general this u will be representing a deformation this delta f will be representing some load it can be a force it can be a moment and we'll see examples of that so this deformation is actually the real deformation okay it has nothing to do with this internal force okay rather this deformation has to do with the actual loading so through this example let us clarify these uh, these ideas okay if i just state it in words it seems very confusing uh, so first step first what i will do is i will just pick up this beam and apply my virtual force this is my delta p please note that i have removed the external loading now uh, at any general cut section at any general cut section in response to this delta p i'm going to end up with a moment and a shear force what i am interested in here is the moment and to depict that this moment is in response to a virtual force unlike the capital m which we usually use i am going to use a small m just to distinguish and uh, tell me what is this m in terms of this delta p the minus delta px minus delta px so here i mean this this distance is the x okay so this is done what about the so you see just quickly referring back to this thing i have determined the internal loading in response to the delta p this internal lo loading that i have just found out is the small m now is the this uh, real deformation in response to the actual loading so this is the actual loading now i have to find out the corresponding deformation okay now you may argue that if you knew how to find out the real deformation in response to the loading why the hell are you doing all these things unnecessarily complicating life like applying virtual force and everything but just think for a moment that the question which has been asked is this actual deflection okay and the way that we have argued in our previous lecture here is that we can actually write this thing so this this equation that i have written for a beam is exactly the counterpart of this equation where please note that always we apply this delta p with a magnitude of 1 okay so for this truss also this delta p is equal to 1 this beam also it is delta p equal to 1 and in uh, example problem that we are doing there also we will ultimately set delta p equal to 1 on the right hand side for the truss problem which had discrete elements we use this i mean we use this sigma but for the beam we use the integration because this is a continuous structure it is not consisting of discrete elements so we have in our hand this small m which we have just found out now is the uh, i mean uh, we have to replace this d theta using these kinds of discussions which i am again not going to repeat now uh, if uh, if you have not gone through the previous lecture please do so you will uh, understand immediately it's not rocket science okay so this thing can be represented as m dx divided by ei you see how nice it is this capital m is just obtained from the consideration of the free body diagram so even though we are saying that we are interested in the real deformations in terms of the actual work that we are doing in terms of the actual effort that we have to put in to solve this problem we just have to 
uh, considered the free body diagram and considered the internal loadings associated with the external loading so coming back to here consider the free body diagram associated with it which you have done millions of times earlier uh, so just like this one we will consider a cut section and we will consider that particular uh, so this left part of the cut section depict this distributed load here and uh, here also we have this so now please note that I am writing this as capital M to denote that we are dealing with the real things here okay I am not depicting the shear force because we are not uh, I mean actually working with it so tell me what is this capital M now so uh, let me just write this this is this distributed load is W okay W with the unit of Newton per meter so tell me w what is yeah so it will be minus W x square by 2 yes minus. Yeah. Yeah, yeah so see for the application of our formula all the things we needed we have now in our hand so let me just write it down quickly so this is 1 actually let me, let me write it properly delta P into the deflection deflection means the desired deflection on the right hand side I have my entire integration because I am dealing with a continuous structure m d theta so uh, actually let me write it here itself because I have put the integration uh, limits as 0 to l I should not be putting d theta rather I should be putting in terms of dx so m dx divided by ei please just refer to the previous slide that is what exactly I have derived here in the previous lecture okay so d theta is equal to m dx divided by ei so that is what we have here so we just now substitute m is equal to minus delta p x please note that this delta p has the magnitude of 1 so here also we can use it delta p equal to 1 this m th uh, thus becomes just minus of x this m it is minus w x square by 2 divided by ei dx now this is just a simple integration I take the w by ei w by twice ei outside of the integration and within the integration what I have is just x cube d dx so this thing becomes w so this is x to the power 4 divided by 4 integration limits are 0 to l so this is just w l to the power 4 by there is a 4 in the denominator from this integration there is a 2 also here so overall it becomes 8 ei so the conclusion is that for this kind of a cantilever beam that is subjected to a uniformly distributed load the deflection at the left end in the vertically downward direction is equal to w l to the power 4 divided by 8 ei okay and let us quickly check if this is the correct answer by referring to the tutorial sheet on the deflection of beams where in the first two problems I had put a catalog of solutions so let us refer to that and this tutorial sheet number eight here uh, the first problem was uh, enlisting the various solutions associated with the simply supported beam that we don't need the second problem had various cases associated with the cantilever beam and this third case that you see I, I hope you can all see this thing okay so maybe I can zoom in so this third case you see this is a uniformly distributed load and the deflection the maximum deflection will be occurring at this end and its value is actually w l to the power 4 by 8 ei actually that's the magnitude this minus sign is depicting the uh, uh, the thing that uh, it is in the downward direction so our answer is basically matching okay so in this deflection of beams chapter you had to solve uh, uh, proper i mean uh, differential equations now through some straightforward uh, algebra we are able to obtain the same answer 
okay so this is the application of the principle of virtual work one of the simplest applications okay next uh, let us look at Sir, yes tell me uh, can you please start the recording i have not started the recording oh my god yes. why didn't you remind me early i i have the backup recording actually uh so okay let me start the recording you should have reminded me earlier sorry okay so we have started the recording we have already discussed one problem uh anyway i have the backup recording going on i'll share that also uh okay so next problem we are again going to consider a cantilever beam but this time we are going to apply a tip loading and no we are not going to find out the deflection at the, at this end which is just pl cube by 3i we'll do that again for the for the uh, for the next topic but for now i want to do something different i want to so if this total length is l at a distance of l by 2 from the left end or the right end i want to find out the slope okay i want to find out the slope so uh, let this end be called a this end be called c and this midpoint be called b so i am interested in determining the slope here okay so this is our question what is the slope at the midpoint in response to this tip loading so you understand physically what is happening i am applying this tip loading this entire beam is bending down and here also there is some deflection but i am not interested in that deflection rather i am interested in the slope there so what should i do tell me so we consider a virtual uh, force at some distance x from uh, one end and uh, we do the uh, derivation as we done in the previous case and we get a uh, function in terms of x and we uh, do dy by dx at that uh, l by 2 length okay all right so i hope everyone else has understood what he is suggesting okay we are not going to do like that but his suggestion is uh, kind of valid so i'm just repeating what he is saying so he is saying that at any general distance x we will apply one virtual force when we do that as a function of x we should be able to determine the deflection so when we do that it is basically equivalent to obtaining the value of y as a function of x that is the deflection as a function of x which we were doing in our deflection of beams chapter and once we do that once we obtain that deflection as a function of x in order to find out the slope all that you have to do is do the uh, first derivative of that deflection with respect to x it's a valid uh, idea but it's kind of lengthy okay there is an easier way directly i'll give you a hint try to think in terms so see force into displacement okay this has the unit of work or energy okay newton meter what else has the unit of newton meter it oh. has moment moment has the unit of, um, of course work but moment has a unit of newton meter so if you multiply moment with the slope when this slope theta is expressed in radians which is radians is just a i mean uh, in the world of angles radians is just uh, dimensionless so m theta is also a work okay in fact we have already applied this idea here m d theta is the work so if before when we were asked to find out the deflection we applied a virtual force can we not for this problem when we are being asked to find out the slope that means a theta can we not apply a virtual moment here that would be a more direct way of proceeding with this problem 
so let's do that we will apply one virtual moment here so in terms of the algorithmic steps which i had outlined in my previous recorded video the four steps i'll follow the exact same things first i'm going to remove this external loading and then at this point where i wish to determine the slope i will apply my virtual moment let this be called delta m not previously i had applied a delta p now i'm applying a delta m not okay so what was the next step of the algorithm in response to this delta m not i must determine the internal loadings which are generated within this beam keeping in mind that we are still not considering this external loading so i can take a cut section here because you see there are kind of two segments now from uh, this end to this midpoint there is one seg segment and from here to here there is another segment so i will consider them separately like i have been doing since uh, since our tutorial sheet on shear force and bending moment diagrams we take piece by piece uh, wherever things are uniform so i take a cut piece here consider the free body diagram to the right of that cut piece or, or, or the right of that cut section or cutting section here there is no external loading x here okay so if i just dutifully write my moment here this m what is this m going to be it is nothing but zero zero okay there is no doubt about it if if you draw the shear force this shear force is also going to be zero okay so everything is zero so from this end to this midpoint you i mean you do not end up with any loading associated with this virtual moment loading next we take a cut here in this segment and again we consider this thing now at this corresponding point at the the midpoint we do have this external well it's not an external thing but it is an applied uh, virtual moment okay and now we have to draw the uh, or we have to determine the m corresponding to that so now you tell me what is the value of this m so delta m not only yes so this is basically m minus delta m not is equal to 0 so m is equal to delta m not the next step of the algorithm is uh, uh, is associated with determining the the internal deformations associated with this external load and that has to be uh, like although we are calling it deformations but effectively we just have to determine for the case of this beam problems uh, we have to just determine the capital m so exactly the same kind of things that we have done earlier in response to this external loading we wish to determine the theta associated with that but that just involves determining this m okay because we wish to write this thing m dx by ei okay so uh, i mean it's a straightforward thing but just for the sake of completeness let's do this anywhere you take a cut section it doesn't matter okay because uh, you see we are we are uh, uh, applying this delta m not here but as far as the ex only the uh, the real external load is concerned there is nothing at this midpoint okay that is just a point of concern so whether you take the cut section here 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 it doesn't matter in terms of a general x we will be able to find out the capital m at any in uh, internal cut section so this is the corresponding free body diagram for this cut section to the right and here 
we do have this M. Uh, just a, just a, sorry, okay. This shear force, although we are not using it, but it is, I mean, it should be upwards, okay, according to the convention which which we have been following. It doesn't matter here for this problem, but I'm just correcting myself. Okay, so. Uh, I did not name this force. This is let's say P. So what is this M? M is equal to minus Px. There is no doubt about it. Okay. Now you tell me what I should do. Just refer to the previous problem what we have done. Delta P into delta we have done. Now we are not applying any virtual force rather we are applying a virtual moment. So we should be writing delta m into theta and that theta will be representing the desired slope. So delta m rather delta m naught which is this uh, virtual moment into theta. This theta is the desired theta at the point B. Then integration 0 to L. Then what? We have this small m and then we have this capital M dx divided by ei. Please also note that just, uh, just as before we have uh, used the magnitude of delta p equal to 1, here also we are using going to use delta m not equal to 1. So this delta m not is going to be equal to 1. Okay, so this one is also 1. This m is also going to be uh, 1, but we will just substitute in the next step. This m is just minus px. So things are shaping up to be quite straightforward now. This m, oh, by the way, we have to be a little bit careful about something that we actually have two different segments. Okay, so although this is the general formula, we have to write this carefully as 0 to l by 2 and then l by 2 to l. So for 0 to l by 2, what is the uh, value of m, small m? Zero. Zero. Okay. What is the value of capital M? That is just minus px. We don't need it because it is multiplied by zero, but let's for the sake of completeness write it. And then for the integration from l by 2 to l, what is the value of small m? It is 1. Okay, and then again minus px divided by ei dx. So this first integration is equal to 0. So no worries there. And this second one, I can take out this p by ei out of the integration. What am I left with here? So integration l by 2 to l uh, x dx. So what is the value of this? Tell me. Three by four. L oh, I made one small mistake. There is a minus p here. Okay. Yeah. Tell me. The three by four L square. Three by four or three by eight. The three. Uh, three by eight. Sir. Yeah. Three L square three by eight. eight. Okay, 3L squared by 8. So this is the answer. So uh, so the final answer is uh, this minus 3PL squared by 8EI. Please note that we are ending up with a minus sign here. What is the significance of this minus sign? Who can tell me? See, theta is a slope. Okay. And its sense will be either clockwise or anti-clockwise. Sir, it is clockwise. Okay. So, this minus sign is basically indicating to us that the virtual moment that we have taken that is opposite to the physical sense of the slope which is actually occurring here. So, had we taken this delta m naught to be clockwise 
instead of this anti-clockwise direction that we have taken then we would have ended up with a positive sign and that positive sign would have indicated that the direction or the sense of this theta as the answer that we are obtaining that is matching with the sense of the clockwise delta m naught that we would have taken. But here we have taken delta m naught as anti-clockwise, so our answer is coming out as minus, meaning that the physical sense is actually clockwise. Okay, so please remember this. All right. So next we are going to the uh, last topic of this semester, which is Castiglione's theorem. Sir, in the previous question, yes, sir. Yes, yes. Tell me. So, in the previous question, the x-axis was from a, no? X and y-axis coordinates. Yes, 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 yes. So, it's like this. Uh, so, this was x. This was x. This was x. All right. And uh, this thing was valid when we were writing m equal to 0 this was valid for uh, for 0 less than x less than l by 2 and this thing this m equal to 1 it is valid for uh, x lying between l by 2 and l which is basically what we have used in this integration but uh, later for revision purposes i am writing it here so everything will be clear Okay, so Castiglianos theorem. Castiglianos theorem. So Castigliano was an Italian engineer. Okay, back in the day, long, long ago. And he was a very clever guy. Okay, so he came up with a couple of theorems uh, which made life really easy in terms of calculations. So uh, through these previous two examples, uh, perhaps I have given you an indication that there are easier alternatives in certain cases at least where you can uh, obtain the deflections without actually having to solve differential equations okay so solving differential equations is not necessarily hard in fact for people who like solving differential equations they may find that method easier uh, but it is generally found that most people and in fact most students find these kinds of methods to be easier okay uh, so if you think that this is easy wait till you see what uh, mr castellino has given us so what we are going to do here is that even though this is a theorem and there is a proof for this actually there are two theorems okay so there are two theorems of castellino we are going to uh, study mainly what is the uh, what is usually referred to as Castiglione's second theorem but many textbooks they interchange it so I think it is a better idea to say that what we are going to study is actually the Castiglione's theorem on deflections okay so what he is saying is this the deflection at a point in a desired look uh, in a desired direction again the same kind of questions which we have been addressing in through our applications of the principle of virtual work this deflection it is simply the partial derivative of the strain energy with respect to the force which is being applied at that desired location in the desired direction i repeat the deflection which we want at a particular location and in a particular direction that will be nothing but the first partial derivative of the total strain energy of the structure with respect to a force this p is that force and what is the nature of this force this force should be applied at that point where the deflection is desired as well as in the direction in which it is desired this is one version of Castiglione's second theorem or Castiglione's theorem on deflections. There is another version to it which uh, involves the slopes and the moments which just says that the slope at a point 
will be nothing but the first partial derivative of the strain energy with respect to the moment which is applied at that point or which is there at that point. These are the two different versions. Okay, so together they are referred to as Castiglione's second theorem or I think it is better to call this thing so there is no confusion I mean who will remember which one is first which one is second so Castiglione's theorem on deflection where uh, when we say deflection we actually mean it is like a deformation because you see the theta is also I mean within the scope of that deflection Castiglione's theorem on deflection because of historical reasons it is called like this all right now remember that we have uh, called this this u as the strain energy okay now after Castiglione came up with this theorem others came after him because it was so useful what they did was they generalized Castiglione's theorem okay and they showed that actually what Castiglione had derived uh, this was uh, applicable only and only to linear elastic materials okay so please please remember this applicable only to linear elastic materials linear elastic materials you are already familiar with what we basically mean is that uh, materials which follow the Hooke's law the generalized Hooke's law okay to linear elastic materials what people generalize this to was that they said that actually with a little bit of a modification we can still use these theorems as long as we understand that this delta is equal to this del u dash del p and this theta is equal to del u dash del m where this u dash it is something referred to as the complementary strain energy Now we have not discussed complementary strain energy uh, you just understand that uh, suppose we have a material behavior like this so you see this is Hooke's law okay this is Hooke's law where this is sigma and this is epsilon and the total area under this this is the strain energy density okay so this this is basically u naught this entire integration under the uh, sigma epsilon uh, plot that is the u naught and the complement of that okay this one this part okay so this part that is the u naught dash so this is the complementary strain energy density now from geometrical considerations you can note that since this overall thing is a rectangle and this is just a diagonal the areas of both these triangles are the same so u naught is equal to u naught dash for linear elastic material for linear elastic materials there is no difference between the strain energy uh, we are talking in terms of the strain energy density here but you understand that you are multiplying by the same volume of the overall materials of the overall body so uh, if u naught is equal to u naught dash for the same body it is going to be u equal to u dash for so for we have this relation for linear elastic materials but if you don't have a linear elastic material so for example if you have a stress strain curve which looks like this and mind you in nature we do have many materials which are like this in such a case the area under this that is still your u naught it is still u naught the strain energy density but when you take the area the complementary area here this one this is our u naught dash the complementary strain energy density and here u naught is certainly not equal to u naught dash 
Please also note that for the purpose of explanation to undergraduate students, these kinds of graphs are shown and everyone is very happy that we have understood these things. But please note that these kinds of plots are applicable and these kinds of explanations uh, where you just say that the strain energy density is just the area under this sigma epsilon plot. This kind of thing is valid only when uh, you are dealing with uniaxial stress cases. If you do not have a uniaxial stress, meaning that you have a multiaxial stress, meaning sigma xx is there, sigma yy is there, sigma zz is there, all of those things are there, then the interpretation of the strain energy density and the complementary strain energy density will not be so simply given by a simple plot like this. Okay. So in terms of tensor notation, you have to use something called the double dot product and things like that. We certainly do not need to learn those things right now. Uh, I discuss these things in the course of, of advanced mechanics of solids, uh, which I think the students in your batch uh, will be taking so the dual degree students who take up the specialization of mechanical systems design they'll be taking up this course in their either their uh, eighth semester or tenth semester i'm forgetting okay uh, I, I have to look up the course structure so either in the eighth semester or in the tenth semester you will be taking it up okay and uh, if i continue to teach like i have been teaching for the past few years uh, then i will teach those things if you are really interested i already have uh, video lectures on YouTube which I recorded last spring semester you can take a look but the thing is that if you really want to look into the proof of Castellino's theorem and everything and all these explanations you actually have to learn from the very beginning right now you do not have the luxury of time but uh, just out of curiosity you may take a look okay regarding the proof of this Castellino's theorem uh, whatever is written in your textbook by Beer Johnson at all please do not study from there it is not given properly okay they have given some kind of i mean weird kind of proof it's not the proper proof in hibbelus book somewhat better version is given uh, an even better version is given in popov's book but all of them they hide some of the real things okay from the students so my personal opinion is that if you are going for a proper mathematical proof we should do it properly otherwise we should not do it Okay, this kind of half-hearted business we should not do. So let's not do go into that proof. You don't require it. Just learn how to apply the Castiglino's theorem. And when you get a little bit older in your fourth or fifth year, learn it properly. Okay, so with that, let's go to the applications. And it's going to be fun, I promise you. So the first problem we are going to take up is the very typical uh, problem which we have done quite a few times till uh, by now which is the deflection of a cantilever beam and you will see how uh, how smooth and straightforward the process is in fact it is so smooth and straightforward i have a feeling that some students will start thinking that if this is so easy and straightforward why was i teaching all the other methods earlier Okay, the answer to that is that uh, those methods were necessary, for example, deflection of beams because that has connection with buckling. Okay, so uh, there, are, there are reasons, there are pedagogical reasons for this. As you get keep on getting older, you will realize. Uh, okay, so all right. So uh, uh, what I will do here? This is the cantilever beam. I, I have the force here. This is the simplest of applications of the Castiglione's theorem on deflections. I want to find out the deflection at this end. Okay. So again, deflection at this end. Very straightforward case because at the point where the deflection is desired, a force is already present. So this is a case of beam bending essentially. Just look at the formula here. I have to do with the first partial derivative of, uh, of the strain energy with respect to P. So what is the strain energy associated with this bending or, or, or for this beam bending associated with this force P? So 
so u for the entire beam is how much tell me m square by 2 ei ds exactly so we have derived these things earlier okay if you do not remember it just go back and refer to the notes uh so integration 0 to l m square dx by twice ei all right now uh, for our m we just have to take a cut section like this i mean so our m is going to be equal to minus px so our delta this is del del p of u so this is del del p of integration 0 to l m square by twice ei dx now whenever students first learn this their their temptation is to just substitute this minus px into this thing do this integration and then do this first partial derivative okay just resist the temptation for a second uh, something easier happens if you first do the uh, the partial derivative of this general integration and then substitute okay so look at it what i'm going to do i'm going to take this integration uh, the, this this differentiation within the integration sign i can do that peacefully without any worries because you see these limits of integration they are constant values if these were not constant values then i would have to use something called the leibniz rule okay so this kind of an operation where you take the differentiation within the integration sign or conversely you take the uh, differentiation outside the integration that cannot be done like Uh, restriction free all the time okay restriction free means if there are i mean these limits of integration are uh, functions of uh, uh, this p and everything then uh, you have to be a little bit careful okay you have to put extra terms there following the leibniz rule but now uh, we don't have any such complications we can just uh, very naively put this thing inside and when you do that what will happen is that you will see this 2 ei is a constant but this m square is a function of p so what is going to happen is that you are going to end up with twice m del m del p so what you are obtaining now is let me just rearrange this a little bit this 2 and this 2 cancels and you end up with uh this uh, m by ei del m del p dx now you see the algebra becomes a little bit easier so now we substitute for m minus px by ei and this del m del p is just minus x p by ei can be taken out of the integration what we are left with is just x square within the integration and this is nothing but pl cube by 3 ei okay so you see this is this part of the thing which i have done here this will be valid for any general beam you don't have to repeat this for any one for for all the problems in fact you can start your subsequent problems not from this step for bending problems rather you can just start writing delta is equal to integration 0 to l m by ei del m del p dx from this step you start you see in three lines we have obtained it okay of course you have to write this thing all right so this is so easy i mean i also think this is easy students also think this is easy okay i'm sure you will also agree with me all right now let's look at another example Uh, i won't do this example in full i'll just uh, tell you that you can do a similar kind of thing here so 
consider this simply supported beam. Statically determinate case, we'll, we are also going to consider statically indeterminate cases, okay? But for now, statically determinate and let the force be applied at this midpoint. All right. So just take a look at the previous problem. We have to start with this delta equal to integration 0 to L m by Ei del m del p dx. Basically, this is our idea. So even before that, we have to know what the expression of m is. The only issue now is that there are two segments to our problem. So from 0 to L by 2 and 0 uh, L by 2 to L. Okay. So perhaps you can uh, you can consider a cut section here and then you can consider a cut section here okay and uh, tell me what are the reaction forces at the two ends if this force is p p by 2 p by 2 p by 2 p by 2 so there is no doubt okay i mean you can do these things simply you just draw a thing like this This is P, this is P by 2, this is P by 2 and now if you take a cut section here, you will get one expression of M which will be valid from 0 to L by 2 and uh, let me just write that. So this is L by 2. And this entire distance, of course, is L. Uh, and then subsequently, you take another cut section between this L by 2 and L. You will get another expression. And if you carry out the integration from 0 to L by 2 piecewise, and then piecewise from L by 2 to L, you will get your answer. But there is an, I mean, different way of doing it. Just exploiting the symmetry of the problem. You see, whether you go from 0 to L by 2, or L to L by 2 is the same situation. Like it's just a choice of setting up your X at this end or a choice of setting up the X at, it, at this end. And remember that what we are dealing with here is the total strain energy. Total strain energy is a scalar. So it should not really matter, uh, I mean, which axis and uh, which way you're pointing your axis and all those things. Strain energy is strain energy, right? So if that is the case, can we not perhaps try to think of it in a slightly different way in this way that delta okay fine this is going to be 0 to L m by ei del m del p dx but for this particular problem okay because of symmetry can we not write delta is equal to 0 to L by 2 twice of that whatever happens from 0 to L by 2 we'll just multiply that by 2 and proceed okay so uh, you try to do this thing once on your own because uh, I want to end the class now and then you go back to this uh, deflection of beams uh, tutorial sheet and look at this thing. See if you get this answer PL cube by 48 EI. The deflection at the midpoint that you get or not. Okay. So uh, let's meet on Wednesday and try to finish as much as possible of examples. Uh, we will try to release the assignment sheet on uh, on Wednesday. Okay, maybe maybe not tomorrow. Maybe Wednesday, and then uh, so this time we are planning that uh, because we are all of you are running short on time. Various other tests are also appearing for other uh, other uh, subjects. So uh, we are not going to give the MS Teams version. 
where you have to spend so much time writing the thing uh, whatever calculations you do and everything just put it in Moodle that will be the end of it okay so thank you very much uh, please go to your next class uh, sir yes sir uh, is this uh, Castic Linux theorem applicable for only a single force uh, external force acting on the body or how can we extend this for uh, multiple forces acting on the body or any distributed forces multiple forces distributed forces doesn't matter okay uh, so if it had been applicable only for single force then it would have the same shortcoming which was there for the uh, application of the principle of conservation of energy which I had illustrated earlier it does not suffer from that restriction okay you can have multiple forces no problem the only thing which you have to be careful about is that when you are calculating your strain energy you have to sum up the contributions from the various loadings and from the various kinds of loadings for example in a combined loading kind of situation the same force may give rise to bending and it may also give rise to torsion so the strain energy associated with bending must be uh, combined with the strain energy associated with torsion for the same force and it will be even more involved if you have multiple forces okay but as long as you are careful about adding up all the relevant strain energies from the various sources you are good you don't have to worry about anything else yes sir got it all right and we will talk about those examples okay so don't worry yes sir thank you sir all right all right go to your next class please sir uh, assignment to uh, ms team version when will be the marks will be out uh, so things have gotten a little bit derailed uh, I'm trying to uh, I mean do it as soon as possible okay so please don't mind okay sir yeah thank you everyone thank please you. go yeah bye